Breaking news right now on the shooting that left four people dead and six others injured inside an Orange County bar. Let's listen in. Appreciate you being here. I'm Carrie Braun, Director of Public Affairs for the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Today we're going to have five speakers for you. Sheriff Don Barnes um, from the Orange County Sheriff's Department, Division Chief Shane Mall from the Orange County Fire Authority, Chairman Don Wagner from the Orange County Board of Supervisors, District Attorney Todd Spitzer from the Orange County District Attorney's Office, and Medical Director Tetsuya Takeuchi from Mission Providence Hospital. Thank you everyone for being here today. It is unfortunate that we're back together talking about another mass shooting incident in Orange County. It was only last year we had the incident at Geneva Presbyterian Church. Today we're back again talking about another incident within our jurisdiction. Um, I want to thank you for taking time to cover this story. It's an important one. I will share with you details as we know it as of today. I will also stress to you that this continues to be an ongoing investigation meaning that we are still processing the crime scene and probably will still be doing that into tomorrow. Um, and it's just a sad day for us. Tropico Canyon is a very quiet community. It is a very close community. And Cook's Corner for decades has been a part of that community. And I will start by just maybe um, clarifying the media, not being critical, but the media has re referred to Cook's Corner as a biker bar. And it might have been what it was 30, 40 years ago, but it's transitioned into something much beyond what it is. It's a, it's a gathering place. It's a place for families to go to share a meal, and it's a tight-knit community within the Chibuco Canyon. And I just want to stress that what happened there yesterday is not a definition of or not consistent with what Cook's Corner in that community is known for. It's a tragedy. We mourn for those who lost their lives, their families. Our condolences to you. To those who were injured, we will be with you to help you recover. And as we progress through this, uh, we will highlight some of the lessons learned and most importantly, highlight the great response that we had, not only from the Orange County Sheriff's Department, but that also from the Orange County Fire Authority as we navigated this very dynamic incident that was unfolding before us. The, I don't know how to start any other way than just saying last night was spaghetti night at Cook's Corner. People gather on that night, they share a meal, it's a tight knit community. It's a tradition that's been taking place there for some time. And it was very tragic in what, how it unfolded rapidly. I want to stress also that as this unfolds, and I want to thank you for your patience as we navigated the many challenges of this dynamic incident. I know that as the media and the community, you want information and you want information fast. And we want to provide that information to you. But first and foremost, we want it to be accurate. And to do that, we have to go through the processes of the investigation. We owe that to the families. We owe that to the victims' families. We owe that to the community. I'm going to walk you through the progression of events that occurred yesterday at Cook's Corner. At 7.04 p.m., we received multiple 911 calls about a shooting occurring at Cook's Corner, an active shooter incident. Multiple deputies from my department responded and were there within two minutes to address the issues that were unfolding at Cook's Corner. When they arrived, they did not know the location of the shooter, and they split to quickly cover ground. I'll cover later the tactics and trainings and how we uh, have grown over the years and our response, and that will make more sense in just a moment. A team of deputies responded to the upper parking lot area where they located the suspect. The suspect began firing multiple rounds at our deputies from a shotgun. Patrol units were struck by gunfire. At least one round went through the unit of a windshield, a windshield's unit. Uh, no of our deputies were struck and no injuries were sustained by them by gunfire or any other means. Despite the great danger, they progressed and encountered that individual and a deputy involved shooting occurred. Multiple deputies were involved in the shooting and we do know and do believe that it was a gunfire from those deputies that ultimately took the life of the individual. 
without a doubt and without the immediate response of them starting uh, immediate tactical first aid and creating an environment where OCFA, Orange County Fire Authority paramedics could then get into the hot zone and start treating individuals. And this is a collaboration that's taken place for years with our agencies. Undoubtedly, uh, more individuals might have been sustained, uh, may have lost their lives. We have, what I'm sharing with you today is a culmination of witness statements who were there and also body-worn camera video that's been reviewed to draw a, um, a chronology of events that occurred within that area. The suspect, John Snowling, 59, residing in Ohio but with a residence here in Southern California, uh, was the individual who shot and killed three people and injured six additional. We're still gathering information about him and what his motives were. He is, we do know he is a retired sergeant from the Ventura City Police Department, retiring in 2014. We do know that he took up residence in Ohio. We also know that he has a second residence potentially in the Camarillo area. And we believe he traveled from Ohio uh, with an ongoing dispute regarding the separation and pending divorce with his wife. I'm going to cover the progression of events that took place. What we know by witness statements is that uh, at that time, 704, Mr. Snowling uh, entered Cook's Corner. We believe he had two firearms in his possession. He then went directly to his wife, who was within the, uh, the business portion, the interior portion of Cook's Corner. Uh, by witness statements, we do not believe that there was any uh, argument that ensued. He drew a weapon. He fired upon his, his wife, soon to be ex-wife, through divorce proceedings. Uh, he, she was struck once. I'm not going to go into the nature of her injuries. She was struck once by gunfire. We do know that uh, somebody who was sharing a meal with his ex-wife was also shot at and struck by gunfire. Mr. Snowling, the suspect, then started randomly shooting at patrons within Cook's Corner. That progressed to the outside area. The individual who was with uh, his wife able, was able to make it outside of the interior portion of the restaurant and into the uh, exterior, ultimately to the roadway out in front. Once outside, Mr. Snowling, the suspect, these are uh, photos. These aren't actual uh, crime scene photos. These are photos by other means. This is the aerial portion of Cook's Corner. This is, would be the front portion. This would be El Toro Road. Live Oak Canyon goes in this direction here. We do know that the interior is where the initial contact took place. We know that there was an exit and the, sus the one of the victims was located here who succumbed to his injuries. We know that in the area and the gunfight that ensued outside as the suspect continued to shoot upon patrons in the outside and interior area, that other individuals were shot in this, in this portion of uh, while he was shooting randomly at individuals. The suspect then retreated to the back area, which is this we call the upper parking lot. This is a view of the upper parking lot here in this location. The suspect had his truck parked in this area. He went back, returned to his truck, gained access to a third handgun and a 12-gauge shotgun back in this area. At that time, an individual went up to encounter uh, the suspect. He was shot. He ultimately was drawn back into this area for first aid after the scene became static, and he deceased as a result of his injuries. The patron who was with his wife was able to make it out to this area, and unfortunately, she succumbed to her injuries. The individual who was shot in this area was one of the gentlemen who succumbed to his injuries. We do know, and this is a correction, and this happens in the fog of war as you go through these very dynamic incidents, that there were six other patrons there that night who were also struck by gunfire. I can tell you all of the individuals who were shot, uh, the three who deceased, not counting the suspect, the six individuals who sustained gunfire are all adults. No children were injured during the course of this encounter. Our deputies responding to this, this area, this would be a view of what they saw up in this upper area. This is the upper area here. This is where the suspect was located. The gunfire ensued and where he was shot 
by our deputies and ultimately succumb to his injuries. I can tell you this, and this is not uh, being, um, I'm proud. I'm proud of the response by our department, not just last year, but this year. And there's a reason why we train the way we do to encounter these type of incidents. And this has been going on for decades. And our training, the tactics, the tools we give people, the trust in them to do their job. And I can tell you in this circumstance, as in every day when something like this happened, I am beyond impressed by our response from our deputy sheriffs. When I talk about these response, and I just want to give you a little bit of what we do, um, for post-Columbine, our department was key in the creation of incident action rapid deployment, active shooter training. MACTAC, which is multi-assault counterterrorism actions capability. How do you leapfrog and use military tactics to approach a facility? Is what they did here, approaching this individual in an outside environment using military tactics, outflank him and encounter him. Our deputies have long rifle platforms, AR-15s. Uh, body, body gear they put on, Kevlar helmets. We give them breaching tools to break into doors and cut off locks, which came in key last year in the Presbyterian Church incident. Our sergeants have drones that can take an aerial platform for intelligence gathering information during critical incidents. Uh, they have individual first aid kits and do tactical medicine. All of these very intentional things we've done for decades to prepare us, unfortunately, for incidents like this have enabled us to intervene use tactics, encounter individuals, bring issues that are dynamic to a static environment, and ultimately save lives of others who have been present during these unfortunate incidents. I also want to thank, once again, the Orange County Fire Authority, if not for our partnership and continued training and collaboration with them, which is unique to us and like none other in the state of California, we are able, through our continued practice and tabletop exercise and drills, to have them included in the way we respond to these incidents. So when something like this happens, it's not one agency and then another agency, it's one community of first responders that allows us to go into these environments and address these threats. Sally, the three victims that were deceased at the scene, I will tell you two of the individuals who deceased have not yet been identified through our process at the coroner's office. Next to the kin notifications have not been officially made, so I'm not going to share information about them other than their gender. The one, one male subject who was the individual who deceased in this area is John Leahy, 67, of Irvine. An additional adult female and an additional adult male, both deceased. One was with the wife and one was uh, made an attempt to encounter the suspect in the back parking lot and hopefully bring this circumstance to an end. Six additional victims were taken to local hospitals. Uh, later, the doctor will describe uh, their ability to treat them and as much as he's willing to share or can legally share about their injuries. I, as I mentioned earlier, all six of those individual, individuals uh, sustained gunshot wounds. I when I talk about how many people showed up, it's, it's actually beyond impressive. I mentioned within two minutes of the 911 call, we had people, our deputies were on scene encountering this individual, which means that within two minutes, this individual created that much havoc upon individuals and created that much damage to those who are patrons within the, the, uh, the establishment. We had over 80 patrol units respond to this incident with over 100 deputy sheriffs who were on scene in different capacities providing uh, crime scene management, uh, dealing with the individuals who are there, creating, uh, treating to their care. We had uh, our four divisions of the Sheriff's Department investigations units were there. Homicide took the lead on the investigation, but our entire criminal investigations division responded. Southeast operations criminal uh, investigator, investigators responded, and Southwest division investigators responded to address this issue. I'm also the county coroner, so our deputy coroners responded to address those who perished as a result of this attack. And we had our crime scene investigators who are still on scene uh, processing the tremendous amount of evidence that still remains at the location. They conducted 40 interviews of individuals who were there as witnesses, but we do not believe we got to talk to all of them. Some people may have returned home after the incident. If you were present, at Cook's Corner last night during this incident, we ask that you call our department commander, 
or dispatch at 714-647-7000 so we can connect you with an investigator and get your statement of what you may have seen at the location. Patrons of Cook's Corner who were there last night had to rapidly leave the location and we have a lot of their personal facts uh, back on scene inside the crime scene. First, we thank you for your patience. I want to thank those who stayed overnight to give statements. I can only uh, imagine how daunting that might have been and how impactful. We did have members of the community who do services for, um, for those who are impacted to make sure that they are getting the psychological and mental health support that they need so that we are not uh, just leaving them alone. That's done through the Trauma Intervention Program of Orange County, who sent numerous personnel there to, uh, to address those issues. I also want to thank the numerous law enforcement entities, not just within Southern California, Orange County, but beyond. Our partners with ATF, the FBI, the municipal agencies within Orange County, Sheriff Robert Luna and Chief Mike Moore from LASO and LAPD, and my 57 partner sheriffs throughout the state, where every one of them offered resources and help during this trying time. Try time. Uh, this is not, uh, it's not easy in our personnel. This is the second uh, deputy involved shooting we had in four days. This is a seven, uh, the second critical incident at this magnitude that we have processed and responded to over the last uh, two years. And be beyond the, uh, the process that we have in place, I want to assure the public that not only do we evaluate our response, the tactics we use, the training, looking for opportunities to improve, but we also have internal mechanisms to evaluate through administrative reviews, internal affairs investigations. The district attorney will talk about his role in doing the officer-involved shooting investigation. The Office of Independent Review also responded out to this incident and was there last night. So we have a lot of uh, ability to review this. Within about 45 days, we will release a critical incident video of the encounter that took place last night that will have, as appropriate, uh, video and other information that we share with the public about how we responded and what we will do going forward. I also want to thank uh, just my department and our community that we serve. It's not uncommon when something like this happens to have an outpouring of support by the, from the community. And that happened uh, last year. It happened again last night. I don't want to respond to any of these, and I hate being up here talking about critical incidents like this. We have to put a stop to these mass shootings. We have to train on a national platform of what we know will be responsive to mitigate them rapidly. And I believe we have, within the Orange County Sheriff's Department, and partnering agencies that do it like we do, when you can respond to a church and be within the worship center within four minutes, and you can respond to an active shooter unfolding, extremely dynamic incident with, with tens, uh, dozens of people on premise trying to get there, navigate the risk, and identify the shooter and do that with a matter of minutes. I think that shows that we are a model agency in how to respond to these. My hope is that we would never have to be the model agency, but the practices and policy we put in place have definitely uh, helped save lives that we have to address these, these critical incidents. So we'll ask questions, I answer questions at the end of, this, uh, of the five speakers, and I thank you once again for being here. Good afternoon. First of all, our hearts go out to all the victims, their families, the first responders, and anyone who was impacted by this horrible tragedy that happened yesterday. I'm going to summarize the OCFA's involvement in the chain of events from our perspective. At approximately 7.05 p.m., OCFA firefighters responded to Cook's Corner to assist the Orange County Sheriff's Department for a reported shooting. The first engine, Orange County Engine 42, arrived on scene in just under four minutes. Immediately upon arrival, the Orange County Fire Authority and the Orange County Sheriff's Department went into unified command. Thanks to the quick and courageous work of the Orange County Sheriff's Department, our firefighters were cleared to enter the scene very quickly and were able to begin treatment and transport of the patients that were on scene. Ultimately, four patients were pronounced deceased on scene, one of them being the shooter and six patients were taken to the hospital, two of those in critical condition. The phenomenal work by the Orange County Sheriff's Department to rapidly secure the scene empowered our firefighter paramedics to get in there and save lives. 
I'm proud to report that the sixth and final patient was loaded in an ambulance and off scene to a hospital in just under 46 minutes, which is an incredible feat in a hectic environment such as this kind of scene. We at the Orange County Fire Authority, as well as the Orange County Sheriff's Department, train for these events uh, frequently, both individually and together. To be able to secure the scene that quickly and get our paramedics in there to render treatment and take the patients to the hospital that quickly is a real tribute to the training, professionalism, collaboration, and the execution of our two agencies when they work together. At the conclusion of the incident, all OCFA members who were part of the incident went through a critical incident stress debriefing process. As you can imagine, the sights that they saw that night uh, were pretty horrific. The OCFA wants to thank the Orange County Sheriff's Department, the FBI, the ATF, Mission Hospital, our local, effect, uh, local elected officials, and the entire community of Tribuco Canyon for working together during this challenging and heartbreaking time. This tragic incident weighs heavy on the community as well as our first responders and our hearts to go out to all who are involved. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Orange County Supervisor Don Wagner. I'm here first as the chairman of the Board of Supervisors to say on behalf of the entire community, to the extent I have the right to do that, the entire county, um, to offer condolences to those who were so tragically uh, injured and or killed last night on behalf of this county community. Um, we do want to know that we are there for you. But I'm not just here as the chairman. I also have the privilege of representing Cook's Corner and the surrounding areas. And I want to say on behalf of the people out there that I represent, I want to say thank you for that outpouring of love and support that's come to so many as a result of last night. And to say thank you to the men and women of the Orange County Sheriff's Department, the men and women of the Orange County Fire Authority. You heard from Sheriff Barnes, you heard from Chief Maul about how well they worked together and how quickly they were out there. Two minutes, that's a remote area. Two minutes to have our Sheriff's Department there and actually running towards the gunfire and engaging and putting a stop to the carnage. Four minutes to get our first responders in from the fire authority to treat the wounded, to do the job necessary to get them off to Dr. Takeuchi, who you'll hear from shortly. They rightly can take pride in their response last night. We in the county can rightly take comfort knowing that these men and women are so well trained and are out there and can respond so effectively, so efficiently, so quickly in such a terrible situation. I want to talk a minute about the area itself. The sheriff told you, Cook's Corner, though we're hearing, oh, it's a biker bar, and in many ways it is. You go out there, you'll see motorcycles galore. There is a sea of chrome out there, because it's really fun to ride your bikes out there. But the truth is, that is a family spot. It draws bikers and so many others from around this county out there. It is a wholesome place. I've been out there when they've done charity events. I've been out there when they put on music shows for our veterans. This is a pillar of the community to overuse that cliche, but it absolutely applies here. It was spaghetti night. We're seeing a community come together and it will be forever sad. There's no other word for it. That such a happy place will now go forward under the shadow of what happened last night. I am in touch with community members out there. We are hearing there will be a vigil. Uh, at, at some point, there was an early effort to try to do it tomorrow. I understand in working with the Sheriff's Department that may be too soon to have the site available. So stay tuned for more details about the vigil that 
will be going on out there shortly so that the community has an opportunity to, to come together and grieve and say thank you to the men and women of the Sheriff's Department. And, and last quick point about this incident, other incidents, and just the issue of mental health in our community. Um, we encourage everyone struggling from, from this crime or otherwise in need of compassionate help to contact OC Navigator's Mental Health Crisis Support Line. The number is 855-625-4657. This county is determined to make resources available to everyone who is struggling from this horrific event and from whatever might be troubling you out there in this complicated world. We are here for you. OC Navigators Mental Health Crisis Support Line, 855-625-4657. Seek help. Seek help for your friends and your loved ones. And thank you again to the Orange County Sheriff's Department and to the Orange County Fire Authority for their marvelous response last night. Good afternoon. My name is Todd Spitzer. I'm the elected district attorney, and um, I'm not so happy to be here. The district attorney has two roles when you have a situation like this. One would be to review the evidence when it's ready to determine any prosecution of the individual who is deemed to have committed a particular crime. In this case, we all know that that issue was resolved by the suspect uh, dying at the scene. So that question has already answered itself. The other role that the district attorney has is to review the officer involved shooting to determine whether or not that was a lawful use of lethal force. Chairman Wagner talked about the fact he represents that district. I represented that district today obviously as a DA, but I was its county supervisor for 12 years and its state legislator for six years. This is personal. I am one of those bikers. I am one of those people that would often go on Wednesday nights to spaghetti night. I am one of those people who understand how the county and the canyons are grieving. It is iconic, it is special, and nothing that happened last night is going to ruin either the canyon, its austerity, its prominence, or Cook's Corner. We mourn the loss of life and we mourn the loss of yet another piece of everyday America that is Cook's Corner. The, the shooter, John Snelling, I hate to even say his name, a former police sergeant. Let that sink in. Last night, brethren law enforcement officers killed somebody who at one time had earned the honor of being a sworn police officer, a sergeant in the state of California. That person is dead. So there's no prosecution, no trial, no opportunity for the surviving victims and loved ones he left behind to confront the shooter, to stand up tall against this kind of action and be counted. And what John Snowling stole from them is one thing that can never be replaced, and that's the life of their loved ones. And for those who survived, he stole their peace and their sense of security. For goodness sakes, police officers are sworn to protect our communities. We trust them with our lives. We call them when we need help. But instead of helping save lives, John Snowling shot and killed strangers he never met and tried to kill one of his dearly loved ones that he obviously at one time loved dearly and deeply. Orange County District Attorney investigators have been on scene since last night and all through the night and again today. And they are reviewing the shooting by seven sworn deputy sheriffs 
that thankfully brought the end to the carnage. Our office is tasked with reviewing their conduct and whether a crime occurred, but I want to be very clear because I don't want to have anybody think that while we're reviewing this, we don't understand something that I, as the district attorney, want to represent very, very clearly because I've been fully briefed with respect to the evidence so far by my team and have reviewed their written memorandum and interviewed them. And there's nothing that I have found at this point to believe in any way whatsoever that their acts were nothing less than heroic and that nothing they did last night indicates any criminal activity or excessive use of force in any way whatsoever. Those seven deputies deployed, we've recovered at least 75 shell casings from a shotgun, from a rifle, and from handguns. Those deputy sheriffs took the action that was necessary to take out the suspect, to stop the danger, to use their training, and to make sure that the suspect could do no more harm. Every single second counted in those few moments. And these deputies, who we're all so proud of, were on scene and engaged the active shooter within minutes of the shots that he was shooting at them. And they were taking fire. And they didn't back down, and they took, did what they were trained to do. And for goodness sakes, and for God's sakes, I am so grateful and thankful. We will continue to thoroughly investigate this. We will obviously form conclusions, but I don't see, although it could change, that my representation to you today or my opinion will be any different based upon what I know now. Victim advocates are standing by to help anybody and everybody who needs assistance and they're commonly referred to as waymakers. We have advocates here today, and I want to make sure that you report that anybody who believes that they need counseling or grief assistance or any resources necessary, they're to call waymakers at 949 250 0488. No one should have to experience this tragedy. No one should experience an all-you-can-eat spaghetti event at Cook's Corner and find themselves faced with gunfire and peril and trying to escape and people who they love and care about harmed and in harm's way. This is our community. And the Orange County Fire Authority, the Orange County Sheriff's Department, all the other mutual aid agencies who deployed down Santiago Canyon Road and up El Toro Road and through Live Oak Canyon, these are places we know and we've known for years. So God bless America, but God bless law enforcement. And let me reiterate unequivocally, Orange County is a place that loves its law enforcement and its firefighters and its first responders. We support them. We don't denounce them here in Orange County. And let last night be a lesson to everybody else in America who's been tearing down law enforcement to understand this is exactly why we need them, because they stop danger, they protect us, and they care. They care deeply. God bless them. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Tessio Takeuchi trauma medical director at Providence Mission Hospital. Yesterday evening um, after 7 p.m. we received a mass casualty um, incident to our hospital and uh, we immediately activated the trauma backup system which um, invited several uh, trauma surgeons, trauma nurses, anesthesiologists and all our staff to the hospital to be prepared to receive multiple patients with gunshot wounds. Um, we received a total of uh, six injured patients, um, all of whom um, was, were hit by gunfire, and uh, two of them were in critical condition, condition upon arrival. 
Um, those two patients uh, were uh, immediately uh, stabilized and resuscitated uh, with uh, successful resuscitation efforts by the trauma team, and uh, the rest of the patients were treated in uh, admission hospital. Um, currently, um, all patients are stable, uh, two still in critical condition, and one patient fortunately was able to release from the hospital. Others are re still receiving active treatment. Thank you. Before we uh, entertain questions, I just want to correct one piece of information. Um, the individual, the shooter, had four weapons. There were three handguns, a 30, a 380 pistol, a 38 caliber five-shot revolver, a 25 caliber pistol, and a shotgun. There was not a rifle. So just to just to correct uh, the statement, there was not a rifle recovered at the scene. There were those four weapons. That will take questions. Uh, Mr. Barnes, I have three questions for you. Um, I just want to clarify that um, he drove from Ohio to kill his wife, a strange wife, Marie. And then number two is, did she have a restraining order against him? And was there a history of domestic violence between him Okay, so there's three compounded questions there. We believe he did travel from Ohio to answer your first question. Um, well, we don't know the motive because he's deceased. We do believe that his, when he, ent when he uh, arrived at the location, it was very clear based on his intent and our interview of witnesses that he walked directly to her. He immediately, there was not a discussion, a dialogue, or an argument. He immediately fired upon her, striking her uh, once. He immediately fired upon her, uh, the lady who was joining her for dinner that night, striking her at least once, who later succumbed to her injuries when she exited the, the establishment out of the roadway. Uh, we're not aware of any domestic violence restraining order that's in place. There were legal proceedings going on as a result of their filing for divorce. They were separated. We do believe that uh, his wife resided in Orange County at the time. We believe it in, in the city of Orange. He was out of... Uh, custody. There was a hearing that was in early August. The status of that hearing, whether it occurred or not, uh, we don't know. There is not any documentation to correspond with the outcome of that hearing within the uh, the the, um, the judicial system. I think I answered all three of your questions. I have a question. Being out in Orange County, I'm one of the county residents myself. Yes, nice to see you, and I'm sorry for the circumstances in which you're here. We've... Um, is there anything that Orange County can do? privately without having to wait for Congress to do something about gun control. I realize this guy was from out of the area, but what about in the area? So the question was, is there anything Orange County can do about gun control? I can tell you that uh, one thing I do as the sheriff is I have what's called an APPS team, that's Armed Prohibited Persons System deputies that go out and get weapons from people who are prohibited from possessing them. Uh, that's the one thing that we can do. I'm the only agency in the county that has that team that does that. And we take guns away from people who cannot lawfully possess them routinely. Uh, regarding your questions to Congress, that would be something that needs to be directed to Congress. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, so the question was, did he? require the, the weapons legally, and did he have a criminal history? Uh, he did not have a criminal history that we're aware of. He did acquire all of the guns legally. Most of the guns were acquired, the pistols uh, were acquired while he was a peace officer. Uh, the 380 pistol was acquired lawfully in 2014, whether that was in 2014 prior to or after his retirement, but it's contemporaneous, approximate to his retirement date. The 380 revolver was acquired in 1987. The 22 caliber pistol was acquired in 1997, and the shotgun was acquired after he retired in 2016. And Sheriff, I have a couple questions. Um, yes. From the, the video of the scene, you can see dozens of crime scene workers on the street outside of the bar, and you mentioned 75 shell casings. Is it believed most of those crime scene workers are shell casings on the two? How many rounds? I mean, I know that's a long way to go, but estimate how many rounds do you believe he fired and how many rounds do you think the deputy? So the question uh, from Chip was, uh, the crime scene markers are at the scene. Uh, were those representative shell casings or some other evidence? It's representative of every piece of evidence they believe is related to the ongoing investigation. And you're, uh, regarding shells or shots fired, that will be determined through the investigation. There'll be a combination of both. 
uh, rounds that he fired from his uh, his weapons, and also a response of deputies firing upon him as they encountered him during the ensuing gunfight. And we also saw a uh, video of the search of his home in Camarillo. Can you talk about what you were looking for? Did you find anything there? Yes, we served a search warrant at his home in Camarillo. The outcome of that search warrant we do not know yet. Keep in mind, and I'm not trying to be uh, dismissive of the questions, but we have hundreds of people working a very dynamic, now static, scene, but it's a large evidence field. Uh, we had numerous investigations and interviews that had to take place. Uh, serving a search warrant is common in an incident like this, but the outcome or was produced in a search warrant, I'm not aware of yet, but we will get to that at some point. Just one clarifying question from your earlier uh, question you had. Do you believe he drove straight from Ohio to the bar, or was he at his home in Camarillo and came down? Uh, we believe he traveled from o Ohio to be here. Whether he traveled from Ohio directly there, I don't think that was likely. I think he came to the Southern California area and then traveled to Cook's Corner when he determined his wife would be there and then encountered her there. Next question. The divorce has not finished. He was proceeding. No, the divorce was still proceeding. There were several uh, processes through that divorce, but it was not finalized. No children? I'm sorry? No children for the marriage? Yes, they do have children. Uh, they're both adult children. I would like to share with you that we did were able to arrange for uh, their adult son to be with his mother, which I think was important. I can tell you that uh, his mother, uh, based on information we've received, is conscious and is speaking. So her, her status seems to be improving somewhat, significantly. Do you, do you believe he unloaded the ammo in the first two weapons and then went back to his truck to retrieve the other two guns? And that's when the deputies encountered him. And how many deputies fired were engaged in that fight. So the question was, uh, at what point did he access weapons? We know that he had two weapons. Uh, they were both either the pistol or revolver or two pistols uh, that he used throughout the initial encounter. Uh, he used those weapons to fire upon other patrons outside as he was shooting randomly. Uh, we do not believe he knew any of these individuals other than the person who may have been with her at dinner, but we don't know that to be confirmed. We know that they were there. She was there with a friend having dinner that evening. Um, whether he reloaded, don't know. He, he, he retreated back to his truck. When he retreated to his truck, he gained access to the third, either pistol or revolver, and then access the shotgun. It's at that point that deputies responded in two minutes. So all this happened within 120 seconds for him to get back to his truck where the uh, deputy involved shooting encountered, and we know seven deputies fired upon him or countered him while he was uh, returning fire, firing upon our deputies as they responded to the scene. How much ammo did he have left at the time he was stopped? Sorry? It was over by 7.07. It started at 7.04. It started at 7.04, and approximately two minutes later, he was encountered. And keep in mind that that's not just the end of our encounter with him. That's just a benchmark of when the threat was terminated. And at that point, then, we have to do all these other things in rapid succession, meaning uh, we refer to it as, as a hot zone. Uh, we have an active shooter environment. You have to contain that and, and validate that there is one and only one shooter. Where there are two shooters, we have to make sure all these areas are safe. Uh, we're entering tactical first aid. We want to make this, the scene safe as quickly as possible for fire authority to bring their paramedics into and on the scene. We did that very rapidly, as shared by the, uh, the chief, talking earlier about how soon that happened. And by the way, when you have nine victims, one deceased suspect, and six people and all the other dozens of individuals that you're assessing in a timely fashion. Having all of those people transported uh, in under about 46 minutes, that is a phenomenal feat. And that goes to the testament I shared earlier about how we train, how we do tabletops, how we do real-time exercises with our partners in the fire authority. It's not just an active shooter, it's in wildland interface, it's in earthquakes, it's in floods. We do all of it and we are perhaps the, the best prepared team, uh, I believe, in the nation. Chip, how much ammo did you have left at the time of the deputy stop? I don't know how much ammo I left, Chip. I know that they are processing that and they'll go through everything. Uh, they'll determine, based on shell casings that they recover, how many rounds he fired from each of the weapons. They'll, they'll determine how many uh, magazines for pistols. Uh, revolvers have a cylinder, so you have to load those manually. And then the shotgun, of course, has a shotgun shell. He was distant from us, so there's not going to be an issue, I believe, of them uh, mis construing our shotgun shells with his ammo because of how far away it was. But they'll count all that, they'll catalog it, they'll do the same thing with our rounds that were shot for the district attorney's investigation that he's conducting to make sure and all this will take place. And as you can imagine, between that and other physical evidence, other items recovered, uh, physical signs, blood trail, 
all those issues are evidence that needs to be cataloged that is enormous. And that will take at least another probably 24 hours to be able to manage that crime scene. So the question is, were we able to determine why he confronted her at Cook's Corner and had he been following her? Uh, if, he's, if he's following her, we, that's not anything we've determined yet, but that would be something we look at in the investigation through talking to family, other people that might be able to fill in those gaps. We're looking for a, a pattern of life, how we operated within 24 hours one week prior so we can draw a picture of, of what he did previously. We do believe that he knew his wife was at Cook's Corner, which is why he drove to that location to encounter her. Okay, thank you for the press conference today. Uh, we appreciate you being here. I wanna just uh, end this in a moment of silence for the victims who lost their lives as a result of this tremendous and tragic incident. And our prayers go out to the families and the Tribuco Canyon community. We pray for all their recovery. Thank you very much. You just heard from Orange County Sheriff Don Barnes and a number of other Orange County authorities sharing what they now know about last night's deadly shooting inside Cook's Corner, a beloved establishment in Tribuco Canyon and across Orange County right there sharing a moment of silence. We will have all the latest developments coming up shortly here on KCAL News at 4 p.m. But for right now, we're going to send you back to regular programming.